final plan panel of the evening, uh, formalization of the economy in a mid-pandemic world, I'd like to introduce our moderator, Mr. T.C. Minakshi Sundaram. TCM, as he's better known, is founder and managing director of Chirati Ventures and the fintech sector lead at the firm. He has over 35 years of industry experience, including at Wipro and Walden International India. TCM, over to you. So what we are going to talk about is about how technology is playing a transformative role in formalizing the uh, largely informal Indian economy. Uh, as we all know, uh, the SMEs and informal uh, economy contribute to substantial portion of, let's say, employment. Um, maybe 70% of employment is contributed by informal sector. Uh, similarly, they contribute to um, close to one third of exports, uh, SMEs. Uh, and uh, so this is a huge part of the economy. And uh, but that is also the challenge, right? Uh, whenever during a pandemic or challenges, economic challenges come, they face it, uh, they possibly have the highest impact that's happening to them uh, and then struggle. Technology today is trying to create a level playing field. Uh, so I just want to pose a question for everyone uh, saying that, how do you see uh, technology um, now creating a level playing field for um, the SMEs and informal sector. Vichara, do you want to go first? Yes, yes, definitely. And, you know, I think the level playing field aspect is very important because large segments of our society were cut off from access to certain services, certain uh, products, certain facilities that would facilitate their ease of business. And all of that is being enabled by tech solutions and platforms in various sectors. And we're seeing it across the board. Uh, you know, almost any tech platform that you consider is solving for access and affordability to segments that were underreached. Uh, you know, I, I can take one example that is from um, Curate Portfolio, which is, which is Bizongo, and it's a company that I am also closely involved with. Uh, it matches suppliers of packaging materials to their customers. And most of these suppliers are SMEs. They have small plants, they produce one or two products and were suffering from the lack of reach to these big, big buyers of their products. And therefore a lot of these plants were functioning at very low utilization levels. Bizongo plays that platform that connects these suppliers to their potential customers manages all the marketing, the customer relationship aspects so that the supplier can focus on what he's good at, which is producing the product and leaving all the rest of the other aspects to the platform to manage. This results in those suppliers in seeing a revenue increase of 10 to 15% and also allows these customers to buy products at predictable prices, know what they're buying and gives you a transaction history, which is completely digital. That's a classic example of something that was informal and broken becoming very streamlined as because of a tech solution. So there are numerous such examples if you talk about in agri, in health, in B2C, where we see the same thing playing out. You know, I'll start with a, maybe a provocative statement. I am a technologist who's very comfortable saying that there's no such thing as a tech solution. I know for this audience in particular, that might be a tricky statement. But I say that because the causes that went into creating this incredibly robust informal economic sector were human causes. They were structural causes around points of access. They were power structures and social dynamics that led to the evolution of these mechanisms. Where technology plays an incredible role is it allows us to leapfrog the logistical challenges of the transformation we wanna create. But that doesn't necessarily mean that Simply by dint of being able to push out a mobile app, you're going to change the way that society interacts with individuals in various parts of that system. So if that's the starting point in the provocation, then where I go next is to say, well, if these are behavioral challenges, where do we find the low hanging fruit where technology lets us shine a spotlight on the underlying injustice of what it means to be an informal actor in an informal economy, where you are therefore taking on all of the pain of having to navigate information asymmetric markets, of having to deal with natural disasters and all of the plights of the actual creation of growth, and then also getting your product to market. 
So with that in mind, I am, you know, with all of the provocations I've shared, I'm a huge optimist in that I think there are so many products across the value chain that are doing one very specific thing, taking an individual agent in an informal sector and giving them the power to go out and interact differently with the system. I think that's where a significant amount of this hope lies. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, thanks, TCM. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, my learning for last eight and a half, nine years is that, uh, you know, uh, helping anything to the small and farmers, you know, small and marginal farmers, you know, life or their problem could not be possible because of the technology intervention simply because the, the, you know, the marginal farmers, their holdings are very, you know, uh, fragmented. They are, you know, very, uh, you know, scattered and Unless you use technology, we we cannot aggregate. We cannot connect. Uh, you know each dots and you know make it larger. So when I am telling, when I am talking about, let's say, a grain bank model where you know there are thousands and thousands of farmers who have a small quantity of grain to sell, and they are not able to go to the larger market. They do not have access of any platform where they can really you know get the price and sell at the same price what they can see on you know a certain platform. So technology helps here to actually aggregate all these, you know, the micro, uh, you know, the warehouses where the farmer can deposit the grain at village level and, and then, you know, aggregate digitally and connect it to the end buyer, connect it to the lenders. The lender can have access to these assets and they, that, and that, that assets become absolutely a, a collateral, uh, you know, for the farmers to raise finance for the working capital uh, for the next crop. So as for my learnings, uh, you know, without technology, the micro warehouse or the grain bank kind of model, uh, you know, uh, will have a lots of constraint to scale and impact at a large scale to, you know, impact, you know, the millions of farmers. So it is helping farmer also to, you know, transform, use, you know, tech for day to day, you know, that transaction to sell even one bag. You know, selling one bag is only possible, I believe, unless this grain is deposited somewhere in a secure environment. And then it, it's in a wallet and you can just click one button and sell it to the end buyer. We do, we do the profiling of the farmers for the, throughout the year that how much cash flow at what time they require. And this is that cash flow, which is, we call it like portfolio management of a farmer. So, you know, I'm an ex-banker, so I try to manage the portfolio of a farmer, what grain he produced and how much working capital he required at what point of time. Accordingly, we advise when the harvesting is done, so let's say their quantity is very small, like let's say 30, 40 quintal, which is a worth of 70,000, 80,000 rupees. So that grain, when it converted into a digital inventory on our platform, and we give them a grain bank, you know, the Khata book and all that, so they can have access of that, you know, that uh, currency in their, you know, the grain bank wallet. So what happens that after that, the farmers have access to, you know, the NBFCs and the banking partner, which is there on my platform, which helps them to raise finance on that collateral. The grain value is, let's say, the 70,000, so they get up to 70%. So 49, up to 49,000 rupees, they can get a loan, a short-term loan for four to five months or six months on that grain. And that money helps them to take care of their immediate requirement. And also, they differ sales, and they differ the pattern of income also, which helps them to you know, spread their entire cash flow over next four, five, six months. And finally, over next eight to nine months, they realize that their income is basically coming in a tranche and they have avoided all the, you know, that, uh, you know, that, uh, 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 you know, uh, the expenses, unwanted expenses, and they get rid of money lender trap. Take on Vilas's point. I think technology per se is not the, uh, you know, what you want to have on the banner uh, to tell the informal sectors to get formalized. I think that's not the drawing point. I think the key thing for them is to tell them the benefits of formalization. And that benefits of formalization is something that we've already seen in the retail sector with Aadhaar, with uh, you know Jam, and all of the other wonderful stuff that India Stack put out. The equivalent of it needs to come for the informal sector on the business side. And I think the infrastructure is where really I think and technology enabled infrastructure obviously will enable us to kind of formalize at scale. So I think that's the first key point that I would uh, you know make. And I think in that this entire GST IN, which is the new uh, ID that's been created for businesses, like Aadhaar was created for retail. I think it's got a key role to play in formalizing a large portion of the economy. And uh, GST IN will enable us and many other you know, interested parties with the banks and fintechs to really uh, make a difference at scale to the informal economy to formalize that. But the key point also, I think, is um, you know, India, and I always keep saying this, that we have a very strange system that if you're born micro, you remain micro. If you're born small, you remain small. 
And I think the trick really is that will technology enable these guys to actually grow from one level to the other, to advance from being a micro to a small business, because ultimately it has to lead to prosperity. And I think that's really where you know we can see a huge difference being made by formalization because ultimately credit drives growth. India is a credit-driven market. There is no doubts about it. And to drive credit at the informal level, you will need technology and you will need to be able to kind of provide them the ability to grow. And I think that's really where technology per se can help. So in my mind, infrastructure and second is then giving them very, very clear path to growth using the technology of and the credit that is available to the technology, I think are the two key things I can see helping formalization of this economy. So, I mean, you know, I'll just want to throw some very uh, you know, quick numbers. Um, you know, the general working capital or trade credit requirement in India is about $100 billion a month. 43 billion of that comes formally and 57 billion of it comes informally. So if you really want to look at the informal sector or try to formalize it, you're trying to solve the $57 billion problem. But there's no way of solving that $57 billion problem at scale unless you are part of the $43 billion opportunity at the top. Uh, because the only companies who are accessing that 43 billion are the 7,000 odd companies in India, which are about 350 crores of revenue. Um, everybody else follows, falls below the 350 crores of revenue and have some access to formal or the completely informal in nature. So the trick really that we have adopted and I think where technology has really helped us to get to scale to solving that $57 billion formal informal economy problem and getting giving them credit at affordable rate is using all the 7,000 companies at the top to give us a tremendous amount of verifiable data that we can verify through GST and bank statements of the actual transactions and trade that they are doing with this informal economy. Because finally, where does Hindustan liver sell? I mean, they finally sell through a Kiranawala, right? Or an Asian paint sells. He sells through a paint shop sitting in some you know uh, remote place in India. They know what exactly the guy is selling. So they give you that data, and that is the data through which you can really open up this sector. Uh, so I think where you, the only way you can do it at scale, because you know, you're talking roughly at about the most conservative estimate is about 30 odd million. Uh, the most uh, you know, uh, quoted estimate is 60 million of these small little micro enterprises. The only way to reach them at scale and to make a difference to their lives is by getting data from the formal economy that interacts with them. So I think that's the first thing that we do very, very well. The second, of course, is affordability. And ultimately, where technology has really helped us is to change this whole unit economics of this whole deal. For a banker going and giving a line of credit of 5,000 rupees or 2,000 rupees or getting a single invoice of 400 rupees simply does not work. Uh, the unit costs do not lend themselves to lend at that rate. Uh, what we have done with our platform, I guess, and digitization and the ability to kind of use the data that's coming in from the top is to kind of completely disrupt that economics and allow them to lend at even close to 1.1, 1.2% a month which is effectively you know, an 100% reduction or 200% reduction from whatever these informal guys are getting. So effectively, you know, if they're paying 24% a month, they are now paying 11 to 12% a month. And that's really the huge significance. You know, and, and I think that's really the only way in which you can make a material difference to the prosperity of these guys. One is to tell them you'll become formal. Most people assume formal means you pay taxes. And therefore, that reduces their income. Uh, what you really have to tell them is that we can improve your profitability. We can actually increase the cash in hand by reducing your fundamental credit costs, allowing you to grow your business. And the only way you can do that, very strangely or ironically enough, is by being a very big player in the formal economy. Um, you know, people who directly try to do informal economy in India, I think, you know, tempted by C.K. Pralat's, you know, bottom of the pyramid uh, story. I think is, you know, the cost of acquisition, the cost of servicing, the unit economics all defy you to do it at scale. You can still do marginal, but you can't do it at scale. The only way to do it is, I think, what hopefully what we have embarked on is to kind of be part of the formal economy, use the data exhaust that's coming out of that formal economy, the interaction of the formal economy already has with the informal economy, and do that all using technology so that the unit economics can get disrupted. I think that's that's been our secret, uh, really, of using technology and data to kind of reach out to the informal economy. And um, can you share some uh, example that you have seen where um, such transformative AI and data has been able to create that um, from whatever you have seen uh, in India or outside? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, TCM. So um, we are, as you said, true believers in this idea that these solutions can impact problems at two levels. And Ram, this comes back to your point. One at macro levels to change systems approaches to how we address challenges like inefficient pricing markets around agriculture, right? 
And how can you deploy solutions that actually integrate across every single player in the spectrum? And then the second set of categories is uh, where do we allow data to provide a technical input into individual decision making? So from a foundation and a philanthropic perspective, our work is really to identify where the problem exists and then to, uh, through academic centers, through research, through providing funding to problem solvers, but then to also identify how you put adapters onto that, which are either commercial players or social players who then turn that into products, which can sit with individual decision makers. So to support that work, we have launched a $40 million fund for 2021, where we'll be working directly with both academic institutions and civil society players. And as you mentioned at the top of the call TCM, we have also partnered with the World Economic Forum and launched what is probably the first global alliance around the use of AI that focuses not just on building solutions, but building the kinds of solutions that are data-driven, like the ones represented in the Chirate portfolio, and drawing them to a place where we understand what the macro level lessons learned are and deploy them then in an open source environment so other people can find them. You know, I think we often talk about where is there novelty in problems, right? But I often think about where is there novelty in solutions. And in the Indian yeah. ecosystem, we are seeing these incredible solutions bubbling out because of the micro geographies in which you need them, but which then have universal appeal. And so we're really focused on building the infrastructure to learn from and deploy those at a global level. Uh, Ruchira, one of the key questions that always happens uh, is the companies that create impact, do they also create significant financial outcome? And uh, your vantage point uh, as, as an investor in a lot of companies around the world, uh, you also lead globally the health tech uh, investments, right, uh, sector. Um, from your vantage point, have you seen there is a convergence between these two or there is a divergence in them? Yes, it's an absolute convergence for sure. And, and that's the whole thesis behind what we do. Um, you know, I, I look at disruptive tech solutions for South Asia and now for health tech globally. And because of who we are, we are always trying to marry the financial possibilities with high impact. Those are the kind of investments we look at. And I would actually say that their impact that does not generate financial returns to me is not impact because it's not sustainable. It means that at some point money runs out and the impact goes away. So in order for impact to be sustainable, in order for impact to be at scale, it has to be self-funding at some point. And so it is on us to find those opportunities where we see the impact metrics. But I always tell companies that come to see me that to me, impact is a necessary but not a sufficient condition. I need to see financial viability in order for it to meet the bar for IFC to invest. And you know, we, we know several examples, some of which you know, Chirate, IDG are with us jointly and in others where IFC is, has gone with other investors, but across the board, whether it's e-commerce, agri, health tech, we are seeing examples of companies that are breaking out with innovative models, scalable models meeting impact metrics as well as financial returns, right? We have Lenskart that we have invested jointly in and that's actually solving a huge problem. The fact that India used to be called the blind capital of the world with the kind of eye issues that they had and with poor access to diagnosis or the appropriate eyewear in tier two tier three cities. And now there's a digital platform that will allow you to order from anywhere you are. Right, and it is meeting an important need, and it's actually a very successful investment for IFC as well as for the Chirate team. Similarly, on the health tech, and we're seeing platforms like Onco that are linking uh, patients to expert opinions and giving them a guided, hand-holding sort of experience through their to their journey. And those kind of solutions are solving again for impact where a big problem exists and are scaling well to show the financial return. So across the sector, we are seeing such examples and I think the two for me have to coexist. Yeah, and what gets measured uh, is the one that gets improved also. So both, both impact and the returns both need, need measurement. Yeah. Both need measurements and we have, in fact, we get Every investment that IFC does is scored on an impact score. Every VC fund that we invest in, including Chirate, has an impact score that is in our system and tracked. So we estimate what we expect the impact score to be before our money goes in. And then on a quarterly basis, we see if it's tracking towards the same score 
or it gets revised upwards or downwards, almost the same way as we track how we mark up or mark down our investments from a financial standpoint. Uh, you know, for a long time, the idea of impact in these investments or these enterprises were really driven by investors, investors saying, hey, we want to search for this. But from my perspective, what has happened is technology has allowed a new convergence where an entrepreneur can step forward and say, I can build not just a sustainable, but a financially successful business and have as a core part of my entry into the market and activity there, an impact story that leads to a total transformation in how people interact with the system. I think if there's one lesson that I take away from this, it's the final convergence of entrepreneurs now stepping into the impact story, not as recipients from investors, but as owners of their own kind of story in their company. And all of the stories I think we've heard in today's panel reflect that. I think that's absolutely incredible. Unlike the past where the thinking used to be, hey, this model has worked in the US, it's worked in China, let's try it in India, let's try it in Brazil. What I'm hearing now is founders thinking, okay, this is worth my while, I'm going to give up that other job I could have had because I am devoting my life to solving a problem of high magnitude. And the passion and excitement is coming from the size of the problem they are attacking. And that's a refreshing shift. And with the fact that it's an audacious goal, people are enthusiastically pursuing it and funds are willing to back the person with the passion to go after a big and tough problem and go and solve it. So the kind of boldness that I see now coming into the system to go after big problems and solve is going to directly result in high impact. And given that these are tough problems and nobody has been able to crack them thus far, means you're creating a unique path-breaking solution, which should therefore naturally translate to financial returns. And so I think, um, you know, it's, it, I can say with conviction now that we've, we're turning the corner when these two will be seen hand in hand, both by founders and by investors. We are trying to fix a hundred million, uh, you know, that small and marginal farmers issues of, you know, the post harvest challenges and bringing them in the mainstream of, you know, that uh, life to access institutional services, be it storage or credit or market linkage and all that. This is $300 billion market. And I believe, you know, entire, uh, you know, money is going, you know, transiting through the informal economy because farmer gets money through cash payments. We are trying to bring them in the mainstream. We are counting each penny what the farmer is supposed to receive through bank account. And this is going to be the truly financial inclusion, you know, their, uh, you know, the wealth management or their, you know, that um, income enhancement. So I can see that for a couple of years, we'll be able to test one couple of millions of farmers coming into mainstream and increasing their income and, you know, using technology to build transparency and accessibility for my all the member farmer. I, I, I mean, just straight away say that I'll be very disappointed if all we did was provide credit, um, you know, for all the 30 million, 40 million out there. I think the key to really challenge, I think, uh, you know, just as, uh, you know, as an entrepreneur, as uh, someone who wants to kind of uh, make an impact, I think the important thing is to get these enterprises to move one level up. If they're micro to move them to small, small to medium, medium to large. I think that's the key thing. And I think one of the ways that we are looking at it is that how do we give a certificate of credibility, um, give enough tips and tricks to all of these guys that in, you know, just like you use credit, how do you kind of go up in the ranks, right? And um, I think one of the very interesting things that we started off, and I'm really kind of hoping to see that succeed is what we have called now a good business score uh, that we just piloted out with CRIF. Um, and we want to see that getting launched to every single micro enterprise out there. So that they use that as an almost like an L check, an ECG check to figure out how well they are doing in business, whether we can give them tips and then get an old bunch of other government and non-government bodies who can help these guys based on that score to kind of grow. I think that's really, I would say the next three years, other than of course, making a ton of money for everybody here uh, and for ourselves to be profitable, to ensure unit economics works and to reach out to all the millions of people in credit. I think in addition to that, the key thing would also be to see this whole economy kind of grow one level up. Uh, I think that's really the, I think, uh, you know, what we would like to achieve in the next three, four years. Uh, thank you all uh, for uh, participating and sharing your perspective.